Hey, how's it going? My name is John Good. If you don't already know that, but I'm sure most of you do know that that are watching this content. But in this exclusive piece of content, I want to specifically talk about offboarding employees or offboarding people from enterprise networks and systems and how that relates to insider risk or insider threat. So let's do it. Before we get to the rest of the content, I wanna take a minute to talk about today's video sponsor, Vanta. Whether you're starting or scaling your company's security program, demonstrating top-notch security practices and establishing trust is more important than ever. Vanta automates compliance for SOC 2, ISO 27001, HIPAA, and more, saving you time and money while helping you build customer trust. Managing compliance for one standard, let alone multiple, can be complex, but one of the features that I personally love about Vanta is that it allows you to see everything that matters in one location to help keep you informed about the status of your security and compliance program. Plus, you can streamline security reviews by automating questionnaires and demonstrating your security posture with a customer-facing trust center, all powered by Vanta AI. Over 7,000 global companies like Alassian, Flow Health, and Quora use Vanta to manage risk and prove security in real time. It really says something that so many companies are relying on Vanta. You can check out Vanta yourself by visiting vanta.com slash John. And just for being a part of my audience, they're going to give you $1,000 off Vanta. That's vanta.com forward slash John for $1,000 off Vanta. Big thank you to Vanta for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so this idea came up because first of all, I saw an article that made a lot of sense, made a lot of great points, and I thought that was a really good idea. But also, we've been seeing a lot of breaches and a lot of security incidents, hacking incidents or hacking situations at companies that are related to previous employees and accounts that they either had when they were working at the company or even maybe they're within the company still and they don't work in that particular role or that particular situation as far as why they got the account in the first place. So the first thing that I want to do is go through this article here. We'll talk about some key points, some highlights that I've made, and I'll bring it up on the screen here, and then we'll talk a little bit more about it. Keep in mind that just because this article was released at some point at a specific date, obviously as further out we get from the release of this video, the, video, the article will be out for a while, but that doesn't mean the information is somehow all of a sudden obsolete or dated at that point it's still gonna be relevant information based on what we're gonna talk about in this particular video. So let's go ahead and flip over my screen here and let's start talking about the article and go through it. All right, so this article in particular is, says the title is New Research Warns About Weak Offboarding Management and Insider Risks. So again, just like I said originally, that's what we're gonna talk about is this whole offboarding idea of employees from enterprise networks and systems and how that relates to insider threat or insider risks. So let's go ahead and scroll down here and look at this article. So the article says, a recent study by Wing Security found that 63% and also too, just so you're aware, this article was published May 29th, 2024. But again, that date really shouldn't make a difference. So a recent study by Wing Security found that 63% of businesses may have former employees with access to organizational data and that automating SaaS security can help mitigate offboarding risks. So SaaS is software as a service. Basically, that's the idea of you go to some vendor, Amazon, something like that, Salesforce, you buy a specific application or service that they are hosting. They're managing all the back end of it. They're updating the server, patching it, managing the firewalls on that server, all of that stuff and you get access to what's in the application itself. So the GUI, and if you're creating an account within the application, or you're setting up specific views, or reports, or whatever, within that application. So that's the idea of SaaS, if you aren't familiar with that term. It says, failing to quickly and thoroughly remove access for departing employees introduces serious insider threats, leaving a company vulnerable to multiple kinds of risks, such as data breaches, intellectual property theft, and regulatory non-compliance. So since we're talking about offboarding, I just wanna go ahead and kind of describe that or define that for you. Again, if you're not familiar with that term, 
But offboarding is the idea of, let's take the most simplest example here. So an employee starts at a company, they get access to their email, their computer, whatever applications, and all the things they need to do their job. Now it comes time when that employee is going to leave the organization, whether that is voluntary, meaning they have put in their notice, or they're saying, I am quitting, I am leaving the company, leaving my position. Or on the flip side, you have involuntary, meaning you are getting laid off, you are getting fired because you did something you shouldn't do, or you just weren't performing. Whatever the reason is, the whole idea of offboarding doesn't necessarily have direct uh, correlation to the purpose of why you're leaving. There are some important aspects of that as far as how fast you do it and those kinds of things. But offboarding in general, the idea, the concept is just an employee is leaving the organization and now you have to cut off their access or disable their access so those accounts no longer are able to log in. They no longer have permissions and they're no longer enabled. So, and these are great points here, data breaches, intellectual property theft, regulatory non-compliance. Specifically think about this, let's talk about these specific examples and how that can come to light. So data breaches. Somebody has an account, it was never shut off, it was only protected by a password. Now an attacker finds that password because the employee probably reused a password from some other platform or something and that password is now out there in one of the, the databases of the uh, data dump dumps of passwords, and the attacker was able to get in. So they were able to get into your, your corporate network. Intellectual property theft. Maybe they decide that they created something, and they want to go back and get it now because they don't think that you should have exclusive access as the company that employed them when they were doing that. So they're going to go in, they're going to log in, they're going to take it back, or they're just going to take something else. Maybe they decide they just didn't like your company, and they want to take some proprietary data, something like that. And then regulatory non-compliance. As part of compliance certif certifications, ISO 27001, SOC 2, HIPAA, all these different ones, it is a requirement that when employees leave your organization that you disable or completely delete their accounts. We're not going to get in the specifics of why you might disable account versus delete it or how that process all works, but... If you're not disabling them or deleting them, removing them, that alone puts you in violation of a control with a lot of those popular frameworks or popular standards or certificate compliance certifications that you most likely are trying to get or you have got at your organization. All right, let's keep going here in this article. All right, firstly, the security risks of mass layoffs. So this is an important concept here. The average employee uses 29 different SaaS applications. So again, we know SaaS is software as a service. So those are different applications. Maybe that's Dropbox, maybe that's AWS, maybe that is Jira, maybe that is Monday.com or something, right? One of those applications and they have on average 29 different applications that they can access. Could even be Office 365. That's a SaaS application. And so with 29 applications, that's a lot to disable. That's a lot to think about. That's a lot to track, especially if you were doing it manually. Think about this. If you're a small company, you're probably doing some of this stuff manually. But as you grow in scale, so do too the applications that employees have access to and the amount of effort that goes into when employees leave and having to complete the offboarding tasks. Offboarding is usually a team effort involving IT, HR, and other departmental managers. Without clear roles and consistent processes, mistakes can slip through the cracks, leaving organizations open to having their sensitive information leaked or compromised. It's another great point. So when we think about offboarding, offboarding is not just IT. Offboarding is not just the responsibility of security. Offboarding is not just the responsibility of legal. There are all these different teams and departments that are almost always involved in offboarding tasks. And typically it's just all of the, the departments. It doesn't matter necessarily if it's voluntary or involuntary because in some form, the process is essentially very similar. Again, it comes down to if it's involuntary, you're gonna disable accounts a lot quicker and some other things. We're not gonna dive really into that for this, but I just want you to keep that in mind. A lot of different teams have to work together. Typically what happens 
is HR is notified that an employee is being terminated, voluntary, involuntary, right? It's decided somehow within the company that they're going to, that an employee is going to be removed. And so HR has to process certain paperwork and certain legal things to offboard that employee from a legal perspective and employment perspective. Because a lot of times you'll get maybe ongoing health benefits or some other things based on when you're leaving the organization, maybe a severance package or whatever. So all kinds of things. So HR is usually the first part of that process. Even if an employee is leaving voluntarily, they would report to their manager, say, hey, I'm leaving in two weeks or whatever it is. And then the uh, and in the United States, especially two weeks is the standard kind of period that you would give the notice. They would notify HR, HR would put it into the system, start doing their things when it comes to accounts and access and everything like that. Typically from HR, from the HR system, there's some kind of communication that happens where IT is notified at some point, maybe legal and some other department managers or something too. And then IT then is aware that you are leaving on X date. And then if you have equipment, you would ha- they would have to get that back. They would have to coordinate your access being disabled. Typically, that's going to involve security as well. It's going to be a communication with security because after the fact, security has to know that somebody's left. They have to verify accounts have been disabled, all those kinds of things. There are checks and balances that are in place here as far as this whole offboarding process. And... It is very important that the roles in that process are clearly defined, they're understood, they are documented, they're approved by all the different teams, by leadership, whoever has to approve it. It's legally compliant. In some cases, there are issues if you are doing certain things because that might not be legally compliant in your country or wherever that employee resides. And so you have to follow all these different things and make sure that all of these things work together. If you're mass laying off people, that can certainly be complicated just for one application. But if you have 29 applications that employee has access to, that is extra work. That is additional layers of complexity to uh, terminate that employee or to offboard that employee. So everything at scale gets more complicated. That's something that you'll find out if you're just getting in this industry is that, or this career field is that, you know, a single task is not typically all that difficult when it starts being at scale because you have a larger network, you have more applications, it's more complex, the complexity level goes up. Also, the checks that are required go up to have to, to verify and make sure that everything worked accordingly. Time wasted on manual offboarding. Back to the article here. Revoking access manually across multiple platforms and apps can be time consume, a time-consuming hassle. That's why automating SaaS security has been, become crucial. So especially in smaller organizations, organizations that haven't uh, matured enough as far as their IT infrastructure and security programs, they might be doing this manually. One of the challenges with that is if you're manually disabling 29 different accounts, You've got to go into 29 different applications, disable 29 accounts, verify that 29 accounts are disabled, and go through this whole process. That is extremely time consuming. That is extremely painful. It's not something that you should strive for. You should certainly strive for automation because, again, automation is going to be your friend. The larger that your network gets, the more complex that it gets. The more friendly you are needing, you need to be towards automation. You can't do all this stuff manually at scale. It's just too difficult. It takes too much time, and it is going to just destroy your morale uh, and eat up all your time and energy. And it's just, it's a bad time if you're trying to do all this stuff manually. So please, please, please do not do that manually. Do not do that manually. All right, back to the article here. So they go ahead and give four risks of poor offboarding practices. The first one is going to be data breaches. So they say disgruntled ex-employees or those who had inadvertently retained access could expose, alter, or delete 
critical business data, customer information, financial records, or trade secrets. Disgruntled employees, disgruntled ex-employees, those are the employees that get irritated at the company. Maybe they didn't like their team, didn't like their boss, they didn't like their job, didn't like the direction of the company, didn't like what the company was making, whatever. Disgruntled means that they are upset in some form or fashion, and that is certainly a potential that can happen even more so if an employee is leaving involuntary. They're surprised that they're getting fired or they're getting laid off. That might be an extra incentive for them to become disgruntled. Hopefully you can identify that early on, but disgruntled employees have access. That is a huge concern. Remember, employee accounts in general are trusted accounts. They're considered trusted accounts to a certain extent because that person has legitimate access to whatever it is, the application, service, whatever. And so they're going to have a legitimate account that is not likely to trigger alarms and things of that nature. So if you forget to disable their account, you might find later on they've logged in and done something that you wish they wouldn't have done. So again, it gives the examples, critical business data, customer information, financial records, or trade secrets. It's all important information that has to be protected and that you cannot allow a former employee to access. Once they leave the organization, that access has to go bye-bye. The next one is compliance violations. We talked about this briefly. Weaker manual offboarding processes can also lead to compliance violations, especially in regulated industries like healthcare, finance, and government. This can result in big fines, penalties, legal issues, and harm to reputation and credibility. Absolutely. So when we're talking about compliance, again, this is a thing of scale. As you get larger in scale, get a more mature environment, you should be improving your ability to check these things automatically. You don't want to have to go to each application and check individually for a specific account if you can avoid it. Sometimes you have to do that just for various reasons. But in general, that's not what you want to do. From a compliance aspect, especially just if you are compliant to verify that compliance, you would like that to automatically be reported. Again, it's easy to give an auditor evidence if it's automatically reported or it's automatically generated because you just have it. You don't have to go do anything. If they have questions, then certainly you can go back and verify that. But not having automated systems in place, especially with like offboarding, that's a concern because, audit, because auditors are going to ask you about offboarding processes, onboarding processes. How do, you, how do you offboard somebody? What happens when somebody's going to leave the organization? How do you disable their access? What is the time frame that you have to disable their access in? These are all legitimate questions that can be, uh, can be asked and you have to answer them for auditors for customers, for all kinds of different reasons, for senior leaders, even if it's just internally answering the question, something important you need to do. Now, there are certain situations where offboarding can exist, and especially if you're dealing with offline systems, air gap systems, things like that, that may be something that happens or exists, certainly, that absolutely can happen. But your friend is automation. Don't avoid automation, please. You will learn as your network gets, in, gets to scale that if you're doing things manually like this, like offboarding employees, it's going to be really annoying and it's going to take a lot of your time. Probably going to be errors. There's going to be inconsistent results. There's probably going to be some security finding along the way that tells you to go implement automation. <laughs> it's just how it is. All right, number three, insider threats. Absolutely. Former employees retaining access to sensitive systems and data might seek to disrupt operations, steal information, or compromise business processes, as exemplified by the case of two Tesla X employees who leaked 75,000 users to a German media outlet. So again, former employees that are able to get into the systems, they can do all kinds of things. They had legitimate access when they were there. And because they were a legitimate user account and had legitimate access, it's not going to 
trigger any alarms and they know what goes on on the systems. They know how to navigate through the systems and do things that could cause harm. That insider knowledge is what especially makes them dangerous because if they didn't have as much knowledge as that, maybe they were just, they had no knowledge of internal systems and processes, then it would be a lot harder for them to poke around and try to figure things out. Most likely that would probably trigger some kind of alarm or alert and you can look into it. But when people know what's actually going on, they know where the data is stored. They know how to get there. They know the file structure. They know the system security maybe. They know what you're looking for in a certain, certain, uh, for, for certain things. So it is one thing that you have to be so careful with. Insider threats is such a huge risk. We've seen so many organizations get breached by insiders that are just irritated. Even if it's not an insider, uh, it's not a, even if it's an insider that is not disgruntled, so a former employee that's not disgruntled, you know, maybe they just want to log back in. Maybe their account just gets breached. Like there, there's all these things that go through your mind and that you have to account for in your organization if you want to stay secure. Again, you don't want to be on the news for an insider threat that still had an account that was terminated maybe a couple months ago, six months ago. And now you have to answer to why they were able to still have access or why they were still able to access certain things. It's even worse if it's a publicly traded company. And it's even worse if you have to go before a government entity like the House of Congress or something like that in the United States because that is a very bad situation. Now, it can lead to fines. We already talked about several of those different things that can happen. It's just really, really bad. You cannot allow that. You have to be on top of this when employees leave. One of the things that you can do too that I always tell people is when you're looking at accounts and how to track this stuff, think of a single source of truth. So for instance, in a lot of enterprise networks, we use things like Active Directory where employees are initially onboarded or maybe an HR system. HR system may be the official record or the official system of active employees, whether that's contractors, employees, whatever, different people within the organization. And so if you're using that system as a single source of truth, that should be your single source of truth, right? That makes sense. If an employee or somebody is no longer in that system, they're disabled in that system, they never existed in that system, you should not have some account that theoretically should have been tied to somebody in that HR system. Using a single source of truth like that will help you because an employee leaves the organization, that generates an alert or it disables their account in there, whatever the case is, however you have it set up. Now you know that, that person has to be disabled. That is offboarding, offboarding 101. Use that single source of truth. The more systems you have that you're trying to cross-reference, the more complex and difficult this process is going to be. All right, number four, intellectual property theft. Another really bad one. Wing Security Research alarmingly reveals that 43% of businesses may have ex-employees who can still access organizational code repositories on GitHub or GitLab. Poor offboarding can also lead to code exposure and intellectual property theft. Absolutely. So many organizations that are focused on code, if you have ex-employees that are still, still have access to the code, they can do a lot of bad things. Depending on if you have things like merge checks and all those kinds of things in place, maybe some of that you can catch as far as them trying to embed malware or embed malicious code into the software or into the code. But what's to stop them from just taking the code, copying the code? They can just access it. They could copy it and theoretically just go make their own duplicate application or service. Or they could modify it or, you know, kind of 
uh, evolve it <laughs> if your code isn't very good, I guess. But they could do all these different things. They could give the, the code or service away for free. They could sell it off to another nation. There's all these different things that could happen and it all comes down to them still having access. But 43% of businesses, that's so many. <laughs> that's almost half of businesses admit to that. So it is very, it's scary, it's dangerous. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Okay, automation best practices. Using automation and SaaS security posture management, SSPM, is a simple and effective method for consistent and thorough offboarding. Automation not only makes it easier to revoke access across multiple SaaS apps, but also saves a lot of time, frees up resources, and reduces the risk of manual mistakes and oversights. So anytime you can bring in automation into your network, the more consistent that you're going to be, the better results you'll have, the more efficient that you'll be. Even if you're using code, let's say you have a script and it asks you certain parameters, that's better than manually going and clicking around on things. But it's even better if you can simplify that process. Maybe instead of it asking you for 20 different fields or 20 different pieces of information, it asks you for like two. Automation is so important Again, having that single source of truth is really important because that is where the systems are going to make decisions based off of. If they don't have that, that ability to compare, then it's still somewhat manual because you have to somehow tell that application that certain users don't need access or you have to go manually disable them. But if you can start to connect a lot of these services, at least for things like offboarding, then you're going to be in a lot better state. That is going to be a step towards maturing your program. And frankly, it's crucial. If you want to keep a secure environment, keep a handle on user accounts, which is a huge risk, probably one of the larger risks in an organization is user accounts, user access, that whole onboarding and offboarding process, how you provision access or give access to people, how you take it away from people, how you review it, all that stuff. So you have to use automation to start making this stuff better, making this stuff more efficient and more consistent and just freeing up your time. Who wants to log into Active Directory 20 times a day to disable accounts, to change a group or something like that when you could just make it automatic or make it a lot easier and efficient to get things done? I don't want to log into Active Directory that often just to do something like that. That is not enjoyable. <laughs> that is, although that seems cool when you're first starting out and first starting to get into this career field, something that you'll learn really quickly that you don't want to be doing a ton of times. So it's, uh, it's good to understand how to do it, but it is tedious if you have to do it a lot. So keep that in mind. Back to the article, a critical access hospital in Colorado paid $111,400 for a HIPAA violation after a former employee retained access to a scheduling calendar with 557 patients' protected health information even after termination. So the stakes go up, the more sensitive the information. If it's protected information, PII, if it's healthcare information, HIPAA information, stuff like that, credit card information, more sensitive the data, the higher the stakes are, the more penalty or punishment you could have. And so this is all part of cybersecurity 101 kind of things, understanding what you have and trying to leverage automation. If you fight automation and you fight doing some of these things, you're going to find that you're going to be in a painful environment or full of manual effort. And you're going to feel like you're overwhelmed because you're having to manually do a lot of this stuff when you could have just automated it and made your life very simple. Article also says automation also relieves the heavy administration often required for regular audits and compliance reporting. The risk of unknown lingering access after someone leaves is such a concerning threat that, the, that policies require systems in place to detect it. 
So again, this comes down to auditing. If you get audited and you cannot provide evidence for this, you have no way of generating reports or identifying who has access, who should have access versus who should not have access. Can't do that stuff. It's going to look bad on your security department. It's going to look bad on your organization because you either don't have the appropriate resources, so you don't have the uh, correct amount of people to put for or uh, to put the effort in to doing this and staying compliant and securing your organization. You don't have the funds, so maybe you don't have the budget to get tools that you need for automation. Those are all risks. Those can all hurt your organization and make it very, very difficult for you to actually stopping a lot of this stuff and keeping your organization secure. The worst situation you can be in is a breach that causes catastrophic, a catastrophic situation. Nobody wants to ha have to answer to a breach because they weren't doing the things that they were supposed to do. If you're doing all the things you're supposed to do and you happen to get breached, obviously that's an unfortunate situation, but if you can say, I was, we were doing all of these things, this is just a crazy situation, this is a zero day bug or zero day vulnerability or something, you don't look that bad. It shows that you're doing due care, you're doing due diligence, and you're trying to improve your security program, you're trying to make things better. But if you can't say that, then it just looks like you weren't doing your job. You weren't focused on improving security throughout your time there and maturing your program. One of the ultimate objectives of a good security program is it's constantly learning. It's constantly improving, learning from the lessons that, they've, that you've learned before, learning, for th learning from things that went bad, learning from things that went good, documenting, adjusting processes, adjusting technologies. All of these things so that you can continue to uh, improve that program, continue to mature the program, because that will make your overall program better. That will just give you more connect, uh, you'll be more connected to the business and you'll help reduce risk across the entire business. If you don't do that stuff, you probably won't be in the job for too long and you definitely aren't gonna look good because you're most likely gonna get breached too. So there's all kinds of risks associated to not doing this stuff. So with that being said, again, offboarding, onboarding, really important, but especially in this context of this article, offboarding is so important for insider risk and preventing insider threats from being successful, whether that is intentional, it's unintentional, by those employees, those former employees, it doesn't matter because it's all about reducing risk, leveraging automation, trying to do the things to make your program more, uh, more efficient and more mature so that you show your customers, you show your senior leaders, you show your organization that you're committed to security and you're committed to putting the effort and doing the things that you need to do to protect their interests. It may seem simple, but this is one thing that a lot of companies don't get right or they struggle with. So if you can help your organization do this or an organization that you go to, then you will be an extremely valuable asset because you've just helped reduce a bunch of the risk in a critical area that can leave your company with a huge attack surface if you're not careful. So with that being said, we're going to wrap it up for this. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope this was informative and that you got something out of this. And remember, you got to keep doing this. You got to focus on offboarding. You got to focus on these different things that we talk about in these videos and work to improve your program and mature your program for security because that's going to make things better overall. It's going to make life easier. It will make your life less stressful too, frankly. So, Again, with that being said, let's go ahead and wrap it up for this one, and I'll see you in the next one. See you later. <music>